Someone mentioned about study. I think it is absolutely necessary for us to study. A minister is a messenger. And you can't deliver a message if you don't have a message. And where do you get the message? From this book. Delivered via the Holy Spirit. We can learn what it says, but we really can't learn its applicability to us until the Holy Spirit brings it down here. I don't know if you have, but there's been many times in my ministry where I'll study a subject. And I know the facts, and I like it, and it's interesting. But it really doesn't apply to anything. And one day, the Lord comes on the scene and just puts it all together. If you haven't studied very much, if you haven't studied methodically, you're missing a wonderful, sweet part of the ministry. I like to try to get up before a church or wherever I get the opportunity. And my prayer be, God, help me. Please help me to deliver just a little bit of what you let me see. You see, if you haven't been to the Lord and you haven't felt that, you really don't have anything to take, do you? So it's very important that that you study. I don't know how old you are, but it's not too late to study. I hate to tell you, but I was 25 years old. I'd been ordained for four years. I started a pastor of a church, and about six or eight weeks into that, I preached everything I knew. I'd been in church all my life, and I knew what we believed, and I spat a little bit of that. You know what? I had never, ever studied methodically. I kind of got desperate. I thought, Lord, what am I going to do? <laughs> I guess I can start over and preach it again. I knew that wasn't the answer. Now, I don't want you to misunderstand this next statement. But the Lord said, I sent you to school for four years to learn how to do it. You know some methods. Now, I I hesitate to do that because you don't need to go to school to learn to preach. But you do need to be able to read. You know, I've known a couple people in my life that learned to read so they could preach. Have a good friend whose wife helped him with reading because he was called to preach. He's become a very effective preacher, by the way. You need to learn what you can about the Word of God. Now, we uh, learn different things because God has a different place for each of us. That's something that I like about coming here. I see the diversity of gifts and see how that uh, people are differently blessed and differently talented. You know, there, there have been people that I've been able to work with, especially on mission work. They're drastically different than me. They preach different than me. But they can reach people that won't even give me a moment's notice. I think God will make you what he wants you to be. When I started studying, you see, I I knew that I had learned that I was a visual learner. I knew that I had never written a scratch about Bible. So I started getting paper and I started writing down. I remember the first few times I did that, I said, wow, this fits down here. Oh, that goes together. God, working that together. You may not use that method. I don't want you to preach like me. I don't want you to preach like anybody here. I want you to preach the way the Lord wants you to preach. You know, I don't make any bones about it. I, I, I started doing that. And, uh, you know, I was a teacher and I was a lesson planner. And so I sat down and I made sermon plans. I outlined. I outlined to this day. I will probably outline until I die. That doesn't mean that sometimes the Lord will move and you've you, you got to speak. But, but I'm not recommending that to anybody. I feel holy. That I, completely, not wholly that way. W H O. I'm wholly aware that that's the way the Lord wanted me to preach. He's the one that taught me that. And so I don't apologize for it. I will never, ever 
offend you on purpose, okay? If I know somebody's not into that sort of thing, uh, I'll memorize a short outline. I will memorize an outline. And, uh, but I, I, I'll, per, I'll, I'll not offend you. I'll try not to. But you've got to preach the way that the Lord Amen. wants you to preach. He will make you into what you need to be. He doesn't know where you're going to go next week or next year or 10 years from now. I don't know where I'm going to be next week or next month or five years from now. He does. And brethren, I have seen him prepare me in ways that I had no idea what was going on. Wow, there it was. I needed what he had taught me. I needed some method. He's put me in jobs that prepared me for, for this that he'd had me do. The deal is that you, the, the big thing is that you surrender yourself to the will of God. You know, I'd uh, like to preach that rich sermon today. I, I tell you, the Lord, uh, I'm, I'm awful slow about saying the Lord showed it to me because they don't make a mess of it and I kind of, you know, the Lord gets accused of a lot of things he's not guilty of and I don't want to do that. But I was sitting over here, I think, last year, very last part of this school. And this, uh, I thought about this. Here's the notes I jotted. You know, I don't remember anything. Here's the notes I jotted down. And uh, I couldn't get away from it. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was younger, once in a while, I wouldn't want to. I remember a time or two. But I, 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 I just, especially in my pastor, you know, I, I, I don't want to preach that. And so I'd try something else. It don't work. It does not work. You get yourself in trouble. I have gone to the pulpit with two outlines, hoping that I'd be able to go the one I wanted. But, <laughs> but you got to preach what the Lord gives you. And, and this is a little old simple nothing, but it's what the Lord put on my heart. By the numbers, one verse out of five in the Bible has or refers to a number. Maybe I ought to consider numbers, you think? And often, biblical numbers have some special significance. Maybe some significance that we aren't just completely aware of. In fact, I think you have to investigate and learn a little bit to to learn some of that, that significance of, of numbers. My objective today is to uh, pique your interest that if this suits you and, and, and you feel that, that you will investigate this. I'm not going to give you. I'm just going to scratch the surface. You can study on this for months. But... Uh, just pick your interest where that you might look at this and add another little dimension to your study. Two or three years ago, I lose track of time. Started Bible study Wednesday night. Haven't been a lot of people stick with it, but we're still doing it. And when we started, first night I said, we're not going to study the Bible. We're going to study about the Bible. And I carried all I could carry in two loads. Started out with a concordance. You know, I don't think a one of them had used an exhaustive concordance. Used a couple of diction, took a couple of dictionaries, took a book of maps, a book of charts, some on culture, had a pile of books. All of it, as much as I could tell, was pretty factual. If it's not the Bible, you got to look at it with a Critical eye. But you know, uh, uh, anecdotal concordance is pretty true. And uh, of course, I got into the, to the uh, dictionaries, you know. And uh, I think the example I used was the word hell in the Greek. There's three words in the Greek that translate to hell. Now, I'm sure you all know that. They didn't. Or most of them didn't. There might have been one person that did. And I tried to illustrate it to them what a difference it made. Yeah. Yeah. You know, 
Thou shalt not leave my soul in hell, Jesus said. He didn't go to hell. He went to the grave. He went to that place where soul and body are separated. And he said, you won't leave me there. Just three days and three nights. Thou art Peter upon thy rock, this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Heard a lot of people preach that devils in hell can't tear it down. That's true, but that's not what that says. That's death. He's just saying this generation go to the next, the next, the next, it'll die off. And those gates of hell, those gates of death will not prevail against it. It's been 2,000 years. It's still here. I don't know how long the Lord is going to tarry to come. But when he does, according to that promise, there's going to be a church here. It will not die out. So we talked about those things. And, and of course, then I showed them, pulled out a phone. I said, it's all in here if you want to do it that way. I don't use phone. My eyes don't see well enough, and I got to have a little bigger profile. I don't think I've led one of those Bible lessons for the last year. They do. They work it out together. You know, somebody will come across a question, and we've, uh, we, we, we started out with a survey of the Old Testament. Didn't go quite like I planned. I thought we'd go through there and go through the Old Testament, you know, like three or four months. Go through Genesis in a month and a half or so. Oh, they get bogged down. They get one character, and they just want to tear. Well, that's what they want. That's what they're learning. So we did it that way. So we went through a lot of the, new, the Old Testament, the Genesis, and through the Judges. And uh, then we went to the uh, Acts of the Apostles. And uh, the last thing they've endeavored to do, they decided to do the Book of Romans. I said, now, Book of Romans is a little different than anything we've talked about. Uh, we're getting in a little different kind of literature, and they're eating it up. Thank you for the materials that you gave me. Some of our brethren, pastor here being one of them, wrote some, some lessons, I guess, lesson plans for uh, some of the brethren in Africa. To take over there and teach them. And they've been gracious in allowing us to kind of borrow that and work on that. You see what those people got, what I tried to give them. What my goal was to give them a tool, a tool to work with. I don't know enough to tell them what they need, but I wanted to provide the materials that they can use to find it out. Arabic numerals, you know what those are, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, the ones we use, those are the Arabic numerals. I don't know anything else, I'm sure there is, but that the Arabs have given us, but they did give us our numeral system. Oh, by the way, a numeral is a figure, letter, or group of any of these expressing a number. What you write is a numeral. The concept is the number. Understand that? No. Got blank looks. The numeral is a name. It could be a Roman numeral. It can be an Arabic numeral. It can be T-H-R-E-E. That expresses the idea, the idea of that quantity. You really can't see a number it's a concept. It's just a concept. The Arabs, I'm sorry I don't know a lot of this history, some of it, uh, they developed uh, the Arabic numeral system that we use about the 7th or 8th century. It did not get into Western culture until the 9th or 10th century. Now, this is according to Britannica. If you look at other sources, it... Uh, might be a little different than that. What we can be certain of is that the Holy Bible, the Old and the New Testaments, were not written using Arabic numbers. Uh Uh-oh, already messed up, numerals. (laughs) They were not, the Arabic numerals had not been invented, written, whatever you want to say. They didn't exist yet.
Arabic numeration is quite a, quite a good invention for us. Uh, because we have that, we, we have very efficient, have been devised for us, very efficient algorithms. You thought algorithms were all only AI, right? No, we've had algorithms for a long time. Developed algorithms for addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. You all know how to do that, I think, probably. I don't know if they have calculators. Maybe some people fail to get that. But I learned the algorithms for addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. And that's a lot of what I tried to teach in seventh and eighth grade was addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, whole numbers, decimals, fractions, and percent. If I could send you to high school proficient in those, you could survive in high school. There are other things I'd like to teach, but that was necessary. I looked at that as absolutely necessary. I taught in a low socioeconomic area, and I got kids that didn't know their addition tables. And so anyway, that was a challenge, and I, I accepted that challenge. That is quite an advantage. If you don't think so, take some Roman numerals and try to do long division. Okay. I want to talk about gematria. Anybody ever hear that term? You need to know this. This is the one thing in this presentation that you really need to learn. Gematria. As mentioned earlier, the use of special symbols to represent numbers, numerals, is relatively new. We don't use those symbols we have for numerals anywhere else, do we? They're dedicated to numerals. Okay? That's relatively new. The ancients used letters of their respective alphabets to represent various values. This is indeed true of both the Old and the New Testaments, written in, of course, Hebrew, Chaldee, and Greek. In both of these languages, okay, now you're going to have to think on me here, okay? The first nine letters of the alphabet correlate with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. In Greek, alpha would be one, okay? Got that? Instead of using the Arabic numbers, we use the Greek letters. Okay. The second nine letters of the alphabet stand for 10. Whoa, that's different, isn't it? 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90. Does that make sense? That's different than what we're used to. But that's the way they wrote numbers. Numerals. <laughs> and guess what the third set of nine are? 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, 600, 700, 900. Uh-oh. There's only 22 letters in Hebrew. 24 in Greek. Good theory. <laughs> they, add some, they add some characters, Okay. And we don't need to discuss how they do that. It it's, doesn't matter to us. The two languages do them a little differently. We just need to understand that numbers are expressed by the letters of the alphabet. If you will take a word in Greek or Hebrew, and you take the letter, you take the value of that letter, and you add them together. You got the value of that word. You know that's used a lot in the Bible? You're familiar with one of them. How about the number of a man? 666? That's where that comes from. It's called gematria. Gematria. And it's used throughout the Bible. Let me give you a couple of examples. These are both from Greek. The first one is the name of our Lord. And the English equivalent 
of this is I-E-S-O-U-S, Jesus, okay? And the Greek letters used for that is iota, eta, sigma, omicron, epsilon, and sigma. Iota is 10, eta is 8, sigma is 200, omicron is 70, epsilon is 400, sigma is 200. If you add those together, you get 8, 8, 8. Now we're going to learn in a few minutes that 8 has some implications in the Bible. We'll get into more detail later, but now it means the new birth. New cre- create that kind of fits Jesus, doesn't it? New creation or new beginning. First Adam came and fell, and we got a second Adam. A new beginning. We'll talk about eight later. I just snuck that in so you'll see that it's significant that it's eight eight eight. It's just not at random. Brethren, this goes on hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. It was written, I am convinced, purposely inspired by the word of God. Don't believe me. Get this stuff and study it. Get you one of those alphabets, add them up and see what it says. I'm going to give you a key what the different ones mean. You can look them up. They're they're all over. Um, Anybody ever looked at numbers this way? Yes, dedicated. Uh-huh. You need to look at it. It's, it's, it's worth your time. It might be valuable to it, and you might not, but I think some of you might find some beautiful things. There. Oh, the other example I have is uh, amen, which is sometimes uh, translated verily. The English is just exactly the way we spell it, A-M-E-N, and the uh, Greek letters are alpha, mu, eta, and nu. And they are one, 40, 8, 50, to add up to 99. What does 9 signify? Finality or divine completeness? That kind of fits, doesn't it? Okay. I think that subject is worth your, uh, uh, your attention if you are interested in it. Germatria, that's the well, way you'll get the notes if you want them. Uh, we'll talk about the specific numbers later. Before we get to that, I want to I, I want to talk about another thing that just it, it just uh, really gets me here. Um, when I taught, uh, I, I, I taught those algorithms I was telling you about. You know, the addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, all that stuff. I was picking up what they hadn't learned before. They should have had all that introduced. They did get to introduce one thing in seventh grade, and that was we called it integers because that's the simplest kind of, uh, of numbers. But uh, negative numbers is basically, they learned for the first time that we have positive numbers and negative numbers. And I learned how I got to teach them how to maneuver those and how to combine them. So to facilitate that, back behind me, above my chalkboard, I had a number line. Zero was right above my head, and every once in a while, at even intervals, there'd be a slash mark, and beside that would be a, a under that would be a title, plus one, plus two, plus three. That's your right, yeah, and negative that way. That's the way it came. I added something to it. On each end, I put an arrow point. Why would I put an arrow point? Because that number line doesn't end at the end of my room. It keeps going. Keeps going this way. I used to ask my kids, what's the biggest number in the world? They had this discussion, you know, gazillion, da 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 all that stuff. I say, well, I'll add one to it. I got a bigger number. Or I'll multiply it by two. Or I'll multiply it times itself. Or I'll multiply it times itself as many times as it is. Hmm. That's called Infinity. Kind of like God, I think. No beginning and no end. Goes on forever and ever. My mind 
can't really fathom just the idea of infinity. You know, it, it, uh, it, it doesn't stay close around because the, 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 the earth's around, so it just go, goes out into space. Some galaxy out there 12 billion light years away, it, it goes that far. It goes that far from beginning to end. That's all in the hollow of God's hands. Okay? When he, in creation, he created uh, uh, matter, time, yeah, didn't he? Wasn't it time? The evening and the morning were the first day. It hadn't been time for then. And space. There wasn't anything except God. You ever think about that? There's two kinds of things. God and everything he created. I, I, I've thought about that. I made that statement. I thought, boy, I hope that's true. And I keep thinking, I keep thinking, trying to think of something that is that God did not create. I haven't found it yet. You find it, let me know because I'm making a false statement. The more I get into this, the more I'm glad about that experience I had with a nine-year-old boy because this infinite God I have peace with. You're not going to get around him. I'm going to go right straight to him. Oh, well, let's go ahead. Uh, uh, zero's right here. Let's draw another number line. And, and we're going to, this one's horizontal. We'll make this one vertical. It's the same scale, you know, da, 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 da. Plus up, negative down. Okay, you got that? Got your brains going right. Number line this way. Number line this way. Arrows on both ends. So it goes on and on and on and on and on. Wow, it's not two-dimensional. It goes this way too. Not only so, was it 1736? A guy by the name of mathematician Rene Descartes came up with the idea of a plane. We can combine geometry and algebra. Don't worry, we're not going to teach you that today. You don't have to worry about it. <laughs> don't be afraid of the terms, okay? But using these two scales... You can go over here five, and you go up three or however, and it, it defines a point up here. He was sick in bed, and he saw a fly on the ceiling, and he said, how can I tell somebody else where that fly is? Right. That's kind of the way he started conceptualizing this. And so now we got two dimensions. This plane is infinite. Oh, I got to tell you something. I left out something. I... I really don't have a number line there. Can't draw a number line. A line is defined to be, to have length, but no width. My number line was about at least a quarter inch heavy, so the guy in the back that wore the glasses could see it. But I can't really draw a number line. That's just a model of it. That represents it. You see, like uh, we said a while ago, it's all in your head. You know, it's a concept, a three or five or whatever. This number line's a concept. Oh, God is a concept, not here, but down here. I can't see him, but I know he is. And the more I learn about him, the greater it is. So it goes on forever and ever that way, on forever and ever that way. And all this in here, it's all point. Now, we got to do one more thing about a number line and I'll move on. Let's take the first number line, zero and one, okay? I can go one half, one over two, one over four, one over eight, one over 10 billion. Hmm. How far can I go? As far as that number is over there, my denominator can be that same size. In other words, I, I, I can get infinitely close because a number line doesn't have width. A point has no dimension. How can I talk about something to understand it? It has no dimension. It doesn't exist as far as eyes are concerned. Oh, a lot of people say there's not a God, but we know there is. Amen. These are just little, little ideas about arithmetic and all, you know. Oh, how much greater God is. Amen. Yeah. 
So, the statement is this. Between any two points on a number line, whether they're 10 light years long apart or they're two angstroms apart, between any two points on a number line, there are an infinite number of points. So God is not only the first and the last. He's not just far and wide God. He is deep God. It goes on and on and on because it has no dimension. God is not physical. He's not limited to these things. He's a spirit and he's to be worshiped in spirit and in truth. He's infinite. One more thing on that and I'll move on. Oh my. Um, We make another number line. This one starts at the same zero and it's perpendicular to both of those and it goes this way positive and it goes that way negative now i can little make point all out in here i used to have a special day i'd teach kids this and if i had a good class we'd uh, star wars is not star wars star trek was big and they were all into it and so we'd have battles you know and we'd locate the klingons over here and the starship enterprise over here and we'd try to you know teach them how to get one to the other all that's infinite. All the dimensions of it. Infinity. I, I study about it and it just reminds me of God. Reminds me of God. Let's move uh, to uh, measurement. Had to teach measurement. Now we count and that is exact. There's no measurement that's exact. An engineer will give you a... a a measurement, he's going to put a tolerance on it. You know, it's a 0.663 plus or minus. You look around here and you see people trying to sell land, and it'll say six acres plus or minus. That's so they can't be taken to court, I guess, because it's not quite what they say it is. Because you can't get that exact amount. You can't do it. If you buy a piece of gold, it's Point nine, point nine nine, point nine nine nine, point nine nine nine, whatever. There's no such thing as pure gold. You can't buy it. You can't buy it. it. Doesn't exist. Not for sale. You buy very, very, very pure gold, but you can't buy pure gold. God is exact. God is exact. If, if two people want to compare their measurements, they have to have a common or something that they agree on uh, unit of measure. Uh, we use the foot, probably some king said, measure my foot. That's the, that's the unit of the land, okay? Most of the, country, most of the world now uses a metric system. And before, I think it's 1983, a metric, uh, one meter was defined to be one ten millionth of the distance from the North Pole to the equator going through Paris, France. And uh, the problem with that is, you know, I've crossed the equator going to see Brother Tom, and uh, I didn't see it written on the ground anywhere. (laughs) Kind of hard to tell exactly where it is. So now they define it quite differently. I I don't even know if I want to try to read it or not. Uh, It's uh, how far light will travel. In approximately, and they name it ex- much more exactly than it's been in approximately one three hundred millionth of a second measured in a certain way. I, I've got all, you, you want to look at that? You can come look at it. It'll be in the notes. But the thing is, everybody, every person with a sophisticated physical physics lab uh, has their own standard of what a meter is. The great measurer is God. He's going to measure everybody one of these days. He's going to be exact. (laughs) He's going to be exact. What's the standard? Hmm. Well, God's people were kind of accused by God one time of Measuring themselves by themselves. <laughs> we can get whatever answer we want if we use ourselves. God's not going to use us. Amen. I have in my mind what I think he's going to use. 
He's going to stand you right there for judgment. And he's going to stand you right next to the holiness of God. You say, well, nobody is that good. Amen. These people say, I hope I'm good enough to go. In all probability, they are not. Oh, but there was one man. There was one man who did measure up so much so that the father himself said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what you got to have. When, oh, I need an hour and a half right here. But, but y'all know, this just goes into the fact that Jesus died for us. And when he died for us, he took our sins to the cross. He paid the penalty for our sin. And at the same time, our faith counted as righteousness. And where did that righteousness come from? There's only one source of it. There's only one fountainhead of it. And that's Jesus. He takes my sin, takes the penalty of it, pays the penalty, and imputes to me, all by grace, his righteousness. Woo, that's good. That's the only way you'll get to heaven. That is the only way. I want to go through all these numbers. I don't have time. You can get the, you can get the outline. Don't just take this. I just cherry picked a few things. Uh, if this gemat, uh, gematria, uh, all these numbers are significant. I, I told you a little bit about eight and nine. Is one special? Oh, yeah. One appears more than any of the other numbers. In fact, it appears 1,898 times in the Bible. The Bible represents it as unity, which comes from unit. It implies beginning, source, unity, sovereignty, creation. And the one I like is God himself. He is the one. Amen. If we can have this number line, you've got to have two things. A zero, a beginning point, and a one. All the rest of them are made up of ones. The whole world is made up, created by God. Amen. If you got, don't have God, you've got nothing. Amen. There's a whole lot more on that, but I, 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 I want to mention some of these others. Um, What was the first commandment? God's first. Right. Isn't it? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. We spend 30 minutes on one. Let's go to two. Hmm. Two means a couple of things. Number one, it means union. Took two things and put them together. Secondly, it's division. Two joined together are stronger and more effective than just one. Jesus sent his disciples out two by two. That's not a bad pattern for us to think about following. Oh, in the first union, man and a woman in marriage, there's two testaments, old and new. Before two witnesses, the truth is established. The Ten Commandments was written on two tablets. The second thing created was light, and it divided the light from the darkness. The second day, he divided the firmament. And all that divided, he made it, and then he divided it. At the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, there will be a great eternal separation. First time he came to save, the second time he's going to come to separate. Three. Three special in the Bible? (laughs) I think so. Yeah, it means resurrection, three days and three nights. That's not 
half days. It's not Friday night and Saturday and a little bit of Sunday. It's three days and three nights. Amen. Divine completeness and perfection. God often works in threes. Somebody mentioned something a while ago. The death, burial, and resurrection mm-hmm. is our, the crux of our gospel. Took all three of them. Yep. How about God was, is, and always shall be? Amen. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus, when he was here in the flesh, raised three people from the dead. He was crucified on the third hour. There was three hours of darkness, as we've already heard today. A lot more on that. Four. Oh, that time, I don't know what happened. I thought I'd have to fluff at the end and put fill in. I got a whole bunch of fill in back here. Um, Four. Creation and the world. A lot of things in creation are in force. North, south, east, and west. Earth, air, fire, water, spring, summer, autumn, winter, so on and so forth. I thought it was interesting. David, or Daniel, uh, there was a dream in Daniel, and that pointed to uh, four kingdoms. Babylon, the Medo-Persian, Greece, and Rome. These were earthly empires ruled by men. But there came a fifth one that was ruled by God. Which will bring us to number five. Number five indicates grace or God's goodness. Again, I don't have time to, to, to go into these. Uh, you'll find in, in the notes that there are uh, five offerings in the temple. Temple worship. And uh, I have them named, and you can look them up if you want. Oh, change gears a little. Six. Is it God's number? Mm -mm. Lack seven. It's less than seven. Of course, we know that it's uh, assigned to to the devil. Look at the Bible and look at the characters in it as they're mentioned. Number one, God the Father. Number two, God the Son. Number three, God the Holy Spirit. Number four, Adam. Number five, the woman. Number six, the serpent. Maybe it's coincidence, I don't know. I don't think so. You might. Goliath challenged the enemies of, uh, of Israel, challenged the armies of Israel using spicks pieces of equipment. His helmet, his covering a brass, coat of brass, brass on his legs, piece of brass on his back between his shoulders, a spear, and a shield. Six. He was defeated with a boy carrying five smooth stones. He was defeated by the grace of God. When the, uh, the Israelites were in the wilderness, they began to yearn after the things they had left behind in Egypt when they got unhappy. They yearned for the fish, the cucumbers, the millens, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. The Bible lists six. Coincidence? You son. I don't think so. I think there's a whole lot more to this than I'm getting out. I just want to introduce you to the subject to pique your interest so that maybe you might choose to use this in your studies. Seven, we all know about seven, don't we? God put seven days in the week. You know, the 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 uh, month is determined by the moon. The, the the year is determined by the revolution around the sun. The rotation of the earth on its axis is the day. There's none of those that determine 
seven days a week. How do we have seven day a week? God said so. God said so. Been a time or two in history they've they've tried to change that and it didn't work very well. I remember one I was reading, I forget where it was. I I looked for it later and I couldn't find it again. Um, The donkeys died. They tried a 10 day week. A donkey couldn't take it. They died. I read an article. I was telling somebody a while ago, I used to run. I ran a lot of miles. I ran 30 miles a a week and and, uh, 51 weeks a year. I took one week off. And I ended up running 27,000 miles because I want to do the distance around the distance of the earth at the equator. So I put in a lot of miles. So I was always reading about how to take care of your feet and all that, you know. So there was a deal in Runner's World, there's a magazine about running, about the, the, the best running schedule. You know, how often should you rest? They spent hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know, doing these experiments, seeing how long, how long, how many days you ought to run and how many days you ought to take off. You know what they came up with? They said, well, we think about one day and seven's right. So you can save yourself a lot of money. (laughs) The maker told us that we're to take one day of rest. There's a lot more in this, but I've got to quit. I am over time. I told myself I wasn't going to go over time, but I have. Can I have one more? I'd like to talk about Revelation. Revelation is full of numbers, and they are significant. They are significant. One of them I want to talk about, first of all, in the 11th chapter and the second verse, it says, but the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles in the holy city and shall be tread underfoot 40 and two months. The church would be underfoot for 40 and two months. Okay. And then in the 13th chapter, in the fifth verse, it says, and there was given unto him, the beast, a a, a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies and power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months. Now let's go to 11.3 and it says, and I will give power unto my two witnesses and they shall prophesy 1,203 score days. And then in the 12th chapter, it says, and that means the Lord's looking after his church, right? For that amount of time. Okay. Okay. In the twelve six, it says the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a, where she hath a place prepared. You can't hear that, can you? Good. Okay. Uh, and the woman fled into the wilderness. She had a place prepared of God that they should feed her there, a thousand two hundred and three score day, and one more. And the woman was given two wings, in other words, escape of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she is nourished for time and times and a half time. Two of these are speaking about the punishment of the church by the devil. What's the word I'm trying? I'm not coming up with the word. Boy, words, they're getting away from me anymore. Uh, Persecution, I guess, would be the word I'm looking for. Persecution of the church. Both of those are 40 and two months. The other three are the Lord looking after his church. Two of them are 1,203 score days. And the other one is a time, times, and a half time. I'd like to propose to you that that is the same time segment. Days here, uh, go back to the first verse, I think it is, first chapter, I mean, first verse of Revelation, and it says these things signified, they're all types and symbols. This talks about the dark ages, it lasted 1,260 days, 1,260 years. That's how long they were persecuted, trodden underfoot, but God took care of her for 42 months. 42 times 30 is 1,260 He watched over her for time, times, and a half time. A year, two years, and a half year. Three and a half years times 12 is 42. 42 times 30 is 1,360. As long as she is persecuted, the grace of God is sufficient. Amen. Amen. Amen.